comfortable? Yeah, or you can just wave at me if I forget. Wave them, yeah, if they're comfortable. Okay, is that on, Cece? Oh, yep. Great, thank you. Okay, so welcome to the third, third, not third class in the uh, Boma Azamra series, and um, thank you for coming. I want to, um, some of you, are, a few, quite a few of you are new, so I'm just going to give a very brief overview of what we discussed two weeks ago. We discussed uh, uh, Rebbe Nachman's famous lesson, Azamra, uh, which is in his work, his masterpiece, uh, Lakute Maran. And we discussed the beginning portion of Azamra, which deals with our relationships with other people. For anybody who is interested, um, I, I encourage you to see it. You can uh, see it on YouTube, and you can see it on breastlove.org. And um, we discussed a lot of the uh, psycho-spiritual, is a word I use, aspects of our relationships. Now, I'm going to start tonight, we're going to be speaking about a Zomran context of ourselves. And everything we're doing in, these, in this, these lessons is really just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more. So we are not going to be able to get as in-depth as if we were studying this for weeks and weeks, but anybody who's here is well, you're welcome to call me or text me and I'll answer questions or we can discuss. Okay. So um, I want to... Um, to uh, say that the gist of what we learned last week was basically to look for the good in other people. It sounds so simplistic, and it's actually one of the hardest things we can do. Uh, tonight, um, we are going to begin with what Rabbi Nachman tells us, And also, a person must find good in himself, herself. And Rebbe Nachman explains that finding good in ourselves is exactly related to his next sentence, which is, um, which is that a person, I mean, you may have heard this in a song before, so I'm gonna tell you the words to this song, um, mitzvah gedola leo simcha tamid, right? It's a very big mitzvah to be happy always. And he ties, those aren't the actual words of the lesson, but it's a famous song, you may have heard of it. He ties the idea of joy and happiness in with seeing the good in ourselves. Those two ideas are juxtaposed. And the reason they're juxtaposed is because you can't have one without the other. It's impossible to have true joy if you don't understand the genuine goodness and holiness and specialness and uniqueness of your own self. And we're going to explore that tonight. Now, I, um, I, <laughs> I really don't like it when people say, there are two kinds of people in the world. There are the kind of people who like black coffee and the kind of people who like coffee with cream and so on and so forth. But we do tend to categorize to make things easier for us to assimilate. So it's fascinating that in the full version of Lakute Moran, Rebbe Nachman begins the lesson with how we view other people. But in Reb Nassen, who is his student and tzaddik and scribe and scholar in his own right, he did the Kitzer Lakute Moran, the abridged Lakute Moran, and in that he begins with look for the good in yourself, because that's the essential nature of this lesson. What happens, Rebbe Nachman says, is that when a person starts to think about God, they start to think about the purpose of their lives, they, wherever they are, wherever they're holding, they yearn, their soul is suddenly awakened, and they want to have this connection. They feel there's something besides what they're seeing in this world, what happens is, is all of a sudden, they go in either one of two directions, and here's where that dichotomy comes in. Either they think, oh, okay, so my life is so hard, and um, why do I need to come close to God? He, he's making me suffer, okay? It's a very real response. 
more of the time, Rabbi Nachman says, when people sincerely want to come close to God, what their response is, is they look at themselves and they say, Oi, look at all my flaws. Look at all my weaknesses. Look at all these things that I didn't do right in my life. Why would God want to come close to me? And this question is the defining question of the full lesson in the Ketimaran. Why would Hashem want to come close to you? Okay? Why would He want you? So what we have to begin to do is to discuss why Hashem wants you. And we're going to start with figuring out, okay, who you are and what you are worth. So does anybody remember the um, L'Oreal, they probably still have it today, the L'Oreal ads in magazines and maybe they had the commercials on TV. It was actually the advertising person who did this was a Jewish woman and it was one of the most successful ads of all time. Get L'Oreal, whatever, lipstick, moisture, because I'm worth it. Does everybody remember that? Yeah. I'm worth it. So a whole generation of women grew up, it was the tip of the iceberg in this culture, thinking that if you're worth something, you're worth good skin care, a trip to a spa, uh, uh, designer shoes. I'm not saying those are bad things, but this became tied in with our self-worth. This became part of our culture, that if I'm worth something, I'm going to take care of what? My body. Myself. What? Myself. Myself. Okay. But my body. Okay. Physical self. My, my physical self. Okay. Which we should take care of our physical selves. But this became the message of worth. And what happens is, is all that, all the worth of a person began to fall by the wayside. And that's why secular society and psychologists discovered, hey, people, it's not just that's not the only reason, but it was part of the trend. Wow, people have something called low self-esteem. They don't believe in themselves. And so the answer came to be in secular society, let's tell kids how great they are. Let's teach them that um, everybody has a talent and everybody's special. Okay. So what happens when you say everybody has a talent and everybody's special? I just want the other way. Um, everybody just, uh, particularly in the younger generation, yeah. they, just, they think just because they show up to work, for example, <laughs> they deserve an award. Right. You deserve, right, it became, you get an award for participation. Usually in social movements, there has to be that pendulum swing. Something has to go one way and then the other. Rabbi Nachman says, let's bypass that. Let's figure out what self-esteem, he doesn't use the term self-esteem, but this is all about self-esteem. I call it holy self-esteem. Let's figure out what this really means. Let's discover it. So it doesn't mean just showing up, and it doesn't mean you're just you're special, and it doesn't mean you have a talent and an ability, therefore that makes you greater, okay? And it doesn't mean any of this has to do with your real self-worth. He says our self-worth is something that we have to take a look at and it's absolutely defined by Hashem, by God. That's our self-worth. Because Hashem created us. He gave us our soul. He put it in this body in this lifetime for a reason. So yeah, you do have to take care of your body. But our soul, okay, the quality of our soul determines our self-worth. And the fascinating thing is that nobody knows the true nature of the neshama, the soul. What we know is, is it comes from the highest, highest place. Okay, every one of us has this. There's a famous Rebbe, um, Rebbe Simcha Bonam of Pesishcha, who was said to walk around with a piece of paper in one pocket that said, the whole world was created for me, 
you know this one. And in the other <coughs> pocket, I am dust. Okay. Having this balance between understanding our incredible greatness and the fact that we are nothing without Hashem who supplies us with our neshama, gives us this greatness. Understanding this is going to give us the footing to really determine and understand our self-worth. Okay? So, Rami Nachman says, when a person wants to come closer to God, they start to discover that they have a soul. They're interested. Something sparks them. They want to know more. They want to connect to Hashem. What happens is, and they want to connect to who they are. They want to connect to their source. What happens is, is generally speaking, most people have what can be called a crisis of, of self-esteem. He says that most people start to say, who am I? I'm worth nothing. Look what I've done. But it can volley back and forth between who needs this anyway. I was just doing fine before I was thinking about this stuff. Okay. So Rebbe Nachman says that what we want to do is work through this by beginning to train ourselves mentally to have thoughts, to get in the habit of thinking specific good things about ourselves. The same way we spoke about two weeks ago, training our thoughts to get into the habit to look for the good in others and to look for the bad. We spoke last time and we said that whatever we're seeing, whatever we're looking at, that's going to tend to create our reality. And we also said that when we look, okay, at the good in another person, the Russia, the person who was all, yeah, is no longer there. Because by focusing on the good, the bad fades into the background. It's as if it doesn't exist. Because you can only have one thought in your mind at a time. Okay? You can't think good and bad in your thoughts at the same time. I know some people say they can, but Rabbi Nachman says you can't. So the Rebbe says, turn the mirror and do this for yourself. Now, Reb, no, I may have mentioned this last time. Reb Nassim, one of the Hasidim, said to him, you know, why do you, you know, the Rebbe's gone. We know we're supposed to learn a Zamra over and over again. Why do you keep teaching it? Why do you keep teaching it? And Reb Nassim says, because with a Zamra, every, with a Zamra, if we really live and breathe this teaching, we can bring everybody closer to who they really are, which is a holy being, okay, right? And he said, this is very hard, and the Yetzirah is going to fight against this because the Yetzirah's mission is to suppress our knowledge of who we truly are. That's, that's the goal of the Yetzirah because if we know who we truly are, we're going to be moving in a direction that's always towards the light. We have to believe this about ourselves, just as much as we have to believe it about anyone else, okay? For many people, it's easier to do this on other people, to start with other people, which I think is one of the reasons why he begins Lakutei Moran like that, because it's much easier. If you're an honest person and, you know, we're going to assume everybody in this room, they look at themselves and when they start to examine themselves, they say, oh, oh so flawed. Okay, it's much easier to look for the good in others because we want to do the right thing. We're, you know, women especially. We want to nurture, we want to give, we want to see the good, we want peace, you know, most of us. Okay. All right. So, okay. The next step of this, when we start to look at ourselves, does everybody understand the process of how we look at ourselves? You want the practical hands-on? Okay. So there, before I even go to the next step, let's talk about that. A few ways to do it. There is one way which can be called hisbonanus, which is contemplation. Okay, or hitbonanut, I guess, in Hebrew, right? It's contemplation. And there is a Kabbalistic meditation called hitbonanut. But what I'm talking about is this form of contemplation where a person sits 
And I think I actually, oddly enough, I, I can't even believe it, but it must be real Hashkaka process because I think I spoke about it today or yesterday, where a person takes a few minutes out of their day and they sit and they think about themselves spiritually. Okay, the Lubavitcher Rebbe told his Hasidim, he said, you all, I want you to sit and talk and think about your children's education for half an hour a day. Is that what he said, half an hour? Something like that. Does anybody know? Okay. So Rebbe Nachman saying, no, you think about your spiritual education every day because that's going to inform everybody in your family, not just you, and everybody you come in contact with. Sit and think about this five minutes a day. Okay, so that's step number one. You can write. This isn't a, there's no rules. You can write it down, what you're thinking about. Where am I headed spiritually? These are the kinds of questions you might like to ask. What is good about me? Do I see myself as a spiritual being? What do I see myself as? The next process is called his bodhidus or heat bodhidut. Okay, is everybody in here familiar with that? Yeah? Okay. So this is where we talk to Hashem in our own words. And we have a conversation, a real conversation. You know, you know, Hashem, this is Chaya Rivka, and you know, I'll tell you, I really do want to see the good in me, but every time I do, I notice my flaws, and I don't feel very spiritual. Instead, I feel like a mess. What do I need to do to get out of it? Mm -hmm. And sorry. And when we we need to we need to, that's a, that's right. There's my answer. <laughs> I wonder what that text says. <laughs> so I'm curious. So what do I need to do? So we get answers. That's actually cute because Rabbi Nachman says that when we ask Hashem, who gives us our thoughts? Who puts the thoughts in our heads? Ultimately, the deepest level. Ooh. So what's the test? Hashem, right. Hashem, so right. I don't know. I'm not going to I'm very I'm not gonna, it could be something really crazy. I'm not going to answer. Hashem, he ultimately, ultimately, the most, we, we do have free will. We absolutely do. But there's a paradox. And we can't understand. That's why it's a paradox. We don't understand it. It's outside our ability to comprehend. Okay? Hashem puts the thoughts in our heads. And the answers start to come to us when we become more and more regular in his vote of this the answers start to come to us, okay? So as we start to look for the good in ourselves, um, we can actually begin by telling Hashem, you know, Hashem, this is what I'm doing. I know you want me to look for the good in myself, so here I am, I'm gonna tell you what's good about me. You know, I woke up this morning and I had a cup of coffee and I made a blessing on my cup of coffee. And you know what, Hashem? I held the door open for my neighbor, the one who I really don't like so much, okay? And you know what else, Hashem? I gave some tzedakah. And you know what, and by the time you're done, by the time the morning, you, you can go around the way. By the time the morning is, you know, you've realized I've done, you know what they, the old um, ad for the army, you know, they do more, more things by, you know, dawn than most people do all day, right? Okay. You start to realize, you know, this is, this is, is that funny? <laughs> okay, so this is, this is, we all do this. We, if we start to calculate our good deeds, it's going, you're going to be very amazed, right? Right. Okay. This is something that, you know, a Jew should make a cheshbon hanefesh every day if possible. That's an accounting of the soul. And most people take this to me, that we should sit down and say, oh, I did this wrong, I need to fix that, I need to be better at this. Rabbi Nachman says, okay, it's true, but don't do that. Strengthen yourself first. Oh, I did this right, I'm really good at this, I was very kind here, I, I tried to get closer to Hashem there, I helped another person there. Look at, and by the way, your own family counts. People in your family count, okay? If you're kind to them, that counts too. It's a good deed. It's a mitzvah. It's not just strangers. Okay, I have women that need to be reminded of that. How many breakfasts have you cooked for your family? How many lunches? How many dinners? Okay? I go get some sushi. <laughs> we have you in the last video, by the way. <laughs> you're, you're famous. <laughs> 
that that makes you more famous though. Really? Already famous. Okay, so there we go. <laughs> okay, enjoy. Sorry. Yeah, thank you so much. So, where were we? Uh, be kind. Right. Okay. Your family no, family 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 your family. Right, and even even your especially yeah. your family counts. Actually, <laughs> the truth is especially. Okay. So if you sit down and start thinking about all the good you've done, you're going to be amazed. People are always amazed when they do this, and we have to do this more often than once. Once isn't going to be enough. We need to. Okay, you can't do it every day once a week, okay? Seriously. Now, is this still define our self-worth? No, because these are actions. That's still not intrinsically our self-worth. So what is our self-worth? So at the deepest, deepest level, okay, our self-worth is the soul. Understanding where the soul comes from and who we are, okay? So we have to understand that the creation of the soul is so mystical and so holy and Hashem gave each of us a soul. And we don't know whose soul is better than who else's soul. We have no idea. Okay, probably, almost definitely it's not what we think. Because if we know all the Hasidic tales where somebody knocks at the door in rags and then the person who's in the house, there's so many of these, I don't even have to pick one, mm -hmm. They give them something, they give them some food, they invite them in, they don't judge them, they're kind to them, so on and so forth. And then that person gets a tremendous blessing. And we discover later on that the person who came to the door in rags, okay, arriving on Shabbos, carrying a flashlight when he wasn't supposed to, this person is Eliyahu Hanavi, okay? He's a prophet, okay? And he can bestow blessings. So we don't know the value. What, what looks like the L'Oreal, I'm worth it on the outside, very often doesn't match up on the inside. As a matter of fact, it's surprising how often we cannot judge. We can't make a judgment call. Yeah? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Cannot judge the book by its cover. Right, right. It, it, the, the truth is, is that it, I know this personally, I remind myself of it, and I'm constantly being taught this lesson in my life. It's very easy. It's very easy, but if you're practicing a zamra and you're starting to look and say, you know, I don't know what, remember what we spoke about, giving a person the benefit of the doubt, and I don't know what their story is, and I know that, well, they have this good trait and that good trait, and so on and so forth, okay? So that's okay. Don't worry. So, okay. Any questions or comments so far? We have we have time for discussion because it's a small group. Too. So this is like a spiritual itinerary. Oh, I mean, uh, inventory. Yeah. So like you would. But of, it, but it's a positive one. Right. You're kind of yeah. trying to see. You did yeah, for and, and the there is a there is a weakness that can occur with many people. And Rabbi Nachman does point it out later in the lesson. He says that when we start to do this, and even when we notice the mitzvahs, we're going to second guess ourselves, and we're going to say, "Okay, so um, I gave tzedakah, but my heart wasn't in it. I really wanted to keep the money for myself." <laughs> Okay, or I lit the Shabbos candles and I said the prayer of the candles, but you know, I wasn't concentrating at all. I was thinking about, oh, my dinner's going to burn. Okay, he says you can't do that. That's the Yetzirah. The whole goal of the Yetzirah is to derail you from thinking who you really are, connecting to your source. That's the goal of the Yetzirah. And so you have to fight that. You have to train your mind. So you're flawed. No myths. Okay. You know mitzvah is perfect in intent or perfect in action, okay? There's nothing that says, there's nothing that says that it has to be. You just have to do the mitzvahs and the good deeds in our life. So good enough is good enough. Good enough is good enough. 
it's good enough. It doesn't mean we don't ever want to improve right. or strengthen ourselves. What it means is, is we shouldn't come down ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Look, we know, this generation knows, okay, this, this, your generation too, you're young. Okay, this generation knows, right? We know that when you, this, and, and, and people are speaking about it, children are very sensitive today. When you want to encourage a child today, you don't necessarily punish them harshly and you don't say, look what you did wrong. You say, you point out, you positivize them. You say, oh, I, I see you did this drawing of a house and I lo really like that part where the roof slants. Do you know what an angle is? Isn't that great? You got, the, you got something called perspective. Let me explain it to you. You build on what they're doing right. This is, in my opinion, what the real inner child is really all about. It's not the person that sits in the therapist's office and the inner child is this helpless victim. I, I don't believe that. I think the inner child is somebody that just needs a little encouragement and a little boost in the right direction. And if you've been raised with, you have to be tough, or if you've been raised with, you know, well, the world is doing things to me, either one of those points of view, it's hard to shift out of it. It's very hard to shift out of it. But Rebbe Nachman says you can do it because he pointed it out over 200 years ago, the kinds of things we're, we're seeing today with society and with culture and with interpersonal relationships, he in, in effect predicted a lot of this. And he said, shore yourselves up now, he was speaking to his followers, with all this good stuff and pass it down to your families so your families are intact emotionally. Because you're going to need to hang on to this in order to survive the terrible wave of upheaval that's going to be coming into the world. And we know there's upheaval in the world today. We see it, okay? We don't have to be, you know, we just, it's just like this, okay? So the only thing you can really do is start to believe in yourself and that puts you on firmer ground. Oh, hello, Rabbi Bash. How are you? You can come through this way or out through the other door. <laughs> you're, you're, you're listening to probably one of the most magnificent friends of teachers Absolutely. that exists, yeah. regardless of gender. Oh, 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 Okay, we'll have to cut that out. It's hard to memorial. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's Gil Bash, everybody. And I want to tell you, he's a very special person. He was a... Um, he was a, um, a hero in the IDF, and uh, he saved. He was also a medic, and he saved many, many lives. Very, very special person. And um, in our trip to Uman this year, he's going to come. We're going. Maybe you'll join us, Judy. Yeah. We're, May twenty. We leave May twenty seventh. We're back June third. In our trip to Uman this year, for the first, he's been giving a tour for the men of Uman historical. Hasidic Uman for years at Rosh Hashanah time. And my husband takes the same thing every year and goes with him. Every year, same thing. He says, it's so good, he can't resist it. And I said, well, why don't we ask him to do one for the women? Mm -hmm. So this year, he's, he, well, he's such a good person. He's flying himself out to give the tour. We're going to do the tour Erev Shabbat. It's going to be a three-hour walking tour. And he knows all the ins and outs of the history of Breslov Hasidus in that town. And it's quite fascinating. The little bit I know is really fascinating. So anyway, that's, that's Gil Bash. Okay. Uh, I would just say that for the last two weeks, I was very mindful of finding something good in anybody, yeah. somebody crossing. It really, <laughs> I would have to overrule my first instinct. I'll look at the schlepper that did something and to find, find something. Oh, maybe they didn't have time. But, it really was an incredible exercise in cleaning my brain. But as I was listening to you now, mm -hmm. and putting in historical perspective, just because I'm reading a book about Jews' migration to the United States, mm -hmm. I'm thinking, of course, there was, in the Chitaro, they were surrounded by such hate and being put down. So obviously, this was the antidote. Don't judge yourself by how the outside sees you. Look at yourself and judge by what really feels good and right. 
So I think you might be right. I think that's part of it. But I also think that looking at this in the historical perspective, which I know you like to do, so it's probably right. I, Jews didn't have necessarily so much social interactions, but what was going on in the world of Judaism before the revolution of the Hasidic movement was there was a heavy movement going on where uh, roaming preachers would come to shuls and they would chastise the people in the shuls. Mm -hmm. You're a sinner, you're no good, you're not keeping Shabbos right, you're not doing this right. And the Baal Shem Tov, who was Rebbe Nachman's great-grandfather, came along and said, no, this has got to stop. Because look at these people, look at, look at the society they're living in where they're oppressed from the outside. And tr exactly what you said. He says, that's enough already. They need the opposite. They need to be built up. They need to be built up. People shouldn't be put down. And that was, the, that was one of the keys of the Hasidic movement, was for people to start to see the good in themselves. Because getting back to the joy, yes. the other door. Okay, you can come this way if you want. So the idea was to, you know, was what Rebbe Nachman said in the beginning, which is about joy, which is that your self worth, your understanding who you are, understanding your inherent natural goodness, okay, is tied up and bound up with joy and your joy is bound up with your understanding and self-knowledge. You can't live a joyous life if you don't know who you truly are. And Rebbe Nachman says, you're not who you think you are. You're way, way better than you think you are. You really are. And most people, especially in New York, and, you know, I, I was born here from a family of New Yorkers. And I can tell you, there's a New York attitude, which is the attitude that, there is a New York attitude that isn't always so positive, let's put it that way. It's cynical, it's, it, you're considered a little bit, yeah, maybe not so smart if you're, if you're not cynical, okay? <laughs> okay, you're laughing, it's true, right, yeah. come on. And you know, the more jaded you are, the smarter you must be. And that's New York humor. This is not who we are, and it's hurtful. It's hurtful. And it doesn't mean you're from California if you think that way, okay? It's just not right because it destroys the soul. Doris, you... Yeah, because, you know, I, as you were talking, I was thinking, especially like the family, but then you took it into, you know, outsiders as well. And and not, I was thinking of what you said historically because it seems that the most customary time to do this is when you are getting this huge rebuke, mm -hmm. not even from the Yetzara, but from one of your children, from your employer, from your landlord, and they're trying to do what you said they did in the synagogues. They're yes. trying to tell you right. you've done something wrong, and then the first thing that comes to your mind, even you might not say it, but I did such a great job yesterday, mm -hmm. and I got you into that school. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so you're able to defend so, yourself. Your neshama wants to. Yes. Yeah, so is that like maybe like like a normal catalyst? Maybe. I do know that the reason why we the pro, the baseline reason why we're taught in Hasidus and in Kabbalah that we're chastised or put down um, by other people. Is, isn't necessarily to put us down, it's to make us feel brokenhearted enough to turn to Hashem, mm. okay? It, it's not always necessarily to, to put us down, but oh wow, this is so unfair, this is so cruel, this is so over the top, or, or do I deserve, no, I'm gonna turn to Hashem, okay? And, and that's, you know, it, it, the, the short answer is that's, a, a primary reason why we go through things that we perceive as suffering in this lifetime. But actually, if you take apply here the lesson we had last time and judge these 
people positively, then we could, and no, not that requires really quite mm -hmm. an evolution, mm -hmm. but you can see, okay, they're doing it because they're insecure. They probably feel, the public yeah, you can level do that. feels poverty stricken because he has to make a raise. Just you can make excuses for people, and you can also you don't have to uh, you don't have to you don't have to accept uh, somebody doing something negative. You should. The idea is to look at what they do positive. Okay, my boss yelled at me, but you know what? My paycheck's on time every week. Okay, so then you've done that transference where the negative doesn't exist. Okay. I so looked at it recently. And I said, okay, I've just experienced someone offending me. Yeah. This guy I'm trying to tell me something. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, I started thinking, have I ever behaved in that way towards uh, somebody else? Yeah. And I did find the instances when I did. I said, okay, thank you, I got it. Okay. <laughs> so sometimes it's just a way of saying, okay, here is the mirror, look at it. And you got offended by somebody, but have you done the same thing? And that's how I took it and it made me feel better. Okay, so first of all, <laughs> first of all, that it made you feel better is a lot to your credit, okay? Because some people wouldn't feel better or wouldn't look. But that's what, you know, that's what the Baal Shem Tov said and what Rebbe Nachman said in the first part of this lesson, which you obviously in instinctively know, which is that everything negative we see in another person is projection. We wouldn't see the sin or the negative if we didn't have it, even if it doesn't, even if we don't even understand the relationship because sometimes the relationship isn't so exact. So if we see somebody committing a crime, it doesn't mean that we've necessarily committed the exact same crime, but maybe we've done something that has a relationship to what that person has done. And by doing this, what you've done, um, that's a, actually a high level of tshuva. It's very, you know, it's hard for people to do that. You know, it can be painful. So, okay. So, more questions before I continue. I'm going to skip some of this, I think. Okay. So, Rebbe Nachman steps back after all this. And the truth is there's a lot more to this and a lot of stories and a lot of Kabbalah. But we want to get in the main point of this, too. The, the, the point of the title of this, which is Asamra. And Rebbe Nachman says that when a person goes and they pick one good point about themselves, and another good point about themselves, and another good point about themselves, they are composing a melody. Okay? They're making a melody. They're making what can, could be called the song of the soul. And each person's song is unique. And in the same way, and he compares it to any kind of nigun, any kind of um, melody where somebody's playing an instrument, he says that if a person you know, chooses this good one and this good one, and they leave the bad behind, and they start to focus on the good, it's the same thing as a composer or a musician playing, let's say an improv, playing one good note, and the other good note, and the other good note, and putting them all together, and leaving the bad notes, and he uses this term, behind. And by doing this, we are creating a very personal, certainly unique to us, melody that we offer up to Hashem. And the reason for the title of this lesson is a Zamra Lelokai Be'odi, which is a line from Tehillim, from Psalms, from 146. And it means, I will sing, okay, to Hashem, Lelokai, to Hashem. Be'odi, which can be translated as with my existence, but we know from commentary that it should be translated as with that little bit of me that I'm clinging on to, that I have left of myself. That, that little, those little bits and pieces of who I really am, which is that beautiful, good stuff that I'm finding. And that is my song. It's like my personal song of the spheres, okay? 
It's something that we are doing whether when we're doing this process, whether we're aware of it or not. And by stringing together and noticing all the good points, a beautiful melody begins to be developed. And you can take it as a metaphor. I take it very literally, personally. I, I've done a lot of davening about this. And if, if sometimes it feels to me when I'm able to do this that I can almost hear what it sounds like. And we're taking this and this becomes our own Tehillah, this, to, like Tehillim, like the praises of King David, the beautiful songs, which all had music to them. We don't necessarily know all the music today. We have some of the musical notations. And this is ours, and it's true that David wrote and, and compiled also, because Moshe and Shlomo Melech also wrote some, 150 of them. And we have ours to add to that, okay? And when we add to that, ours, we can rest assured that they're being accepted. This is what Hashem wants to us, wants from us. The same way we know that a parent, the greatest thing you can do to a parent is say, praise their child, okay? So we're Hashem's children. You know, why shouldn't we say, you know, Hashem, this is me, this is me, Chaya Rivka, and I'm not so bad. You made me, so I can't be so bad, okay? And here's all the good things I'm doing, and. And I'm doing them because even if they're flawed, and even if they're flawed, I'm doing them because my soul yearns to come closer to you. I yearn to express myself, and this particular kind of expression is a zamra. It's singing myself. Okay? So it's a zamra adonai be'odi? Lalo kai be'odi. A zamra adonai be'odi. Yeah. Okay. So, by, there's, next week we'll go further with that, but the concept stands. Does anybody hear musical, plays an instrument, anything? Yeah. Okay. okay, so you know that, you know, and, and, and it's very interesting because if you look at modern music, there's a big movement in, in modern music of dissonance. I'm speaking about what they call modern classical. There was a huge movement of the more dissonant and the more harsh sounding. Okay, this reflected the breakdown, to, uh, I think, in people understanding because even in the secular world, people understood for many, many, many hundreds and hundreds of years that God made them and that they had a soul. Everybody knew this. It was common knowledge. It, it wasn't really until the past century that this began to destruct. So, all right, comments, questions? No? You're all here, all just sitting very relaxed looking. I hope you're not sleeping. <laughs> Judy, comments? Listen to each other's song. It's does, does anybody, yes, Daniel? So at what point does this, you know, phrasing, you know, finding the good that we have and stringing, Song and offering to Hashem, at what point that becomes too much? And could that prevent you from actually looking at the parts of yourself that need to be fixed? Yes, we okay. all can, right? So, the first thing is that most people need to start with is strengthening. Okay? And it's different for every person because it's true. When do you need to, you know, take a look at your flaws? So, most people at some point can do this simultaneously. Okay, you know, we can have a, we can sit down and contemplate or we can, you know, uh, speak to a mentor or we could speak to Hashem and talk about this and say, you know, I need to work on this. And he, okay, we can do both. And there is um, technically, like I said, we should make a cheshbon hanefesh every day and we should be able to say, you know, I moved in the wrong direction here. We should be able to say it without it destroying us. And Rabbi Nachman, this is why this teaching is the foundation, because this is going to strengthen you so you're able to feel remorse without pushing yourself away completely. Because if you feel in, a, a shame that's a kind of destructive shame, okay, Rabbi Nachman says this causes atzvus, and, um, which is a bitter, heavy depression. Okay? And when people feel shame about who they are and they feel depressed or they feel this 
kind of cynical, like, you know, what does this matter kind of thing, because I can't even look at the negative. What happens is, is that they shut down to joy. It's then impossible to experience joy. And it's impossible to experience closeness to Hashem. So we have to get to the point where we can do um, an accounting without being destroyed. As a matter of fact, in Breslov, we're famous for this, because in Breslov, in, so most Jews, they know on Yom Kippur, you go to shul and go, oh, I did this, I did that. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you can do vidui, the confession in, in prayers too, in the Siddur, but in Breslov, we try to every day spend a little bit of time every day looking at our flaws too, okay? This is where we start with the good stuff, but we look at our flaws too, and we, 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 we're honest about it. And if you're honest about it, but you still have holy self-esteem, it's not going to wreck you. It's not going to destroy you. It's not going to push you away. Okay, and we say in a breath lover, we say we, you know, at, at Yom Kippur, we're not in such a, a, a state of catching up for the whole year because we've been doing this every day, and we, we're taught that there's no double indemnity in heaven, and that when we judge ourselves honestly, and we say to ourselves, okay, I messed up. Okay, guilty. I, now I'm gonna have remorse, and I'm going to uh, try to fix myself and do better. When we do that, we don't have to face, in the language of the Baal Shem Tov and Rabbi Nachman, a heavenly trial. We've done it. We've done our uh, due diligence. We've been judge and jury, and convict or whatever. And now we're going to fix it, and we're going to work on it. We're never going to be so broken down. You know, the, the, even the Zohar Hakodesh teaches that there are sins that we can't fix in this lifetime. It says it. Rabbi Nachman says that's not true. He says there are, every sin has a fix. It, you can repair everything. You may not be able to, you know, if you've done something that needs a kind of repair that's very difficult, that involved another person, so and forth, so forth. It may be tricky, it may be difficult, it may not even be 100%, but you can fix everything. You can fix everything in this lifetime. That is such a, you know, in, 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 in Judaism, that is such a relief to know this. So we don't, have to, we don't have to have Jewish guilt. That's not ours. That's projected on us. Why do we need to have Jewish guilt? It's not productive, okay? And there was a very famous Breslover, and uh, I, of course I don't remember his first name. I don't know why. I know this story very well. But he was on his deathbed, and he was smiling as Rebbe Nachman smiled. And he, somebody said, he, they said, aren't you afraid? And he said, I have nothing to fear. He said, I, I confess every day my sins. I do tshuva every day. I don't have anything to fear. Hashem's going to just wrap me in his arms, and that's it. He had no, it's astonishing. Like, there wasn't that fear. He just knew he was going to have love because he worked on himself. Mm -hmm. And that's the best any of us can do, is to work on ourselves. So you're thinking about this story is in such a contrast to the famous story of Rabbi Zusha, who is dying, and he is for tears of pouring, and, and his disciples are sitting saying, yeah. "What are you? What are you crying? You were higher than Moses. You were you're more than Joseph, and all this." He said, "Yeah, but they would ask me, were you more like Moses? Were you more like Rabbi Zusha?" And mm -hmm. and so I'm thinking, the, our tendency is the Zusha ourselves yeah. all yeah. the time. So in order he was also a very, a very holy, that's also a holy approach, but yeah. Yeah, but we more right. in the Zusha terrain, and I'm thinking to really practice the brain so it tends to see the positive, which is inclined to see the negative. The negative will be there. So I right. think if, if there's a tendency, first look at the positive. Yeah. Then it's right. easier so to. That's why Azamra is the foundation. But I mean, there are f over 400 lessons, but that's why it's the foundational lesson. It's not always the one you have to learn first. There are others as well that are also good ones. But you know, you have to understand also that Rebbe Nachman was, was actually this is where he was strict. He said, "Do not." He said, "By all rights, we've botched ourselves up so much that we should be, you know, talking to God, crying our hearts out all day long." He said, "Don't do it." Don't do it. One hour maximum. And most people shouldn't even do an hour. And then the rest of the day, put whatever you've done, whatever's eating at you, out of your mind. And this works in the opposite too. 
you have a big worry, you have a big problem, say, I'm going to set aside this much time to think about it. I can cry, I can scream, I can do whatever I want. One hour, 10 minutes, 45 minutes, whatever I want. The moment is gone, I'm going to, my mind doesn't have to go there. I am in control of my thoughts. And if you're not in control of your thoughts, start learning how to be in control of your thoughts. And this really works. I'm not totally in control of my thoughts, but I've been working on it for a very long time and it gets easier and easier and easier. It's like any other muscle you're gonna work out. Like, and this, this has, I wanna tell you that I have absolutely seen people begin this. I mean, again, you're getting an overview. You're not getting every detail, but begin becoming immersed in this and literally, find relief from clinical depression and literally find relief from anxiety and phobias and all kinds of things and not this isn't magic this is understanding there's another door around the other side there's a door around the other side come in this way no come in come in come no there come in it's okay no problem Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he made it. But he made it, right? It's one minute to yeah. nine. <laughs> he corrected. He's here. Good. Beautiful. Look at him. Amazing. Who knows what he ran from, right? right. To get here. So here's my question. So it sounds like through this Azamra, it's almost is Rebbe Nachman saying, or am I getting this wrong? Yeah. That if we do this, we could correct ourselves in this present lifetime and not have to keep coming back for correction? We should, well, we should try. We, we, we could. He, he himself said, he, he said, you know, when you get up there, tell them you don't want to come back. <laughs> Just hang on, tell them I'm not coming back. <laughs> you don't want to come back because the, the, the liabilities here are, oh, you know. <laughs> he said, yeah, go. You know, but technically, um, so, so theoretically, yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, but, you know, we have to really learn it. Like, we have to really, like, we have to have a chavrus and we have to sit down and we have to learn because that is the, um, this is the key. The good parts is the key to being strong enough to deal with the not so good parts. We have to strengthen ourselves, and 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 I want to tell you something. I have been working on a, a, on this book. This is on my own called Holy Self Esteem, which is about this, and it's a workbook. And so this is like I have other lessons I love to teach, but specifically this one narrow portion of Azamra is the part that I feel is is just so important for people. And what happens is is that no matter what you're going through, like we think, oh, is this just about me, so on and so forth, but whatever you're going through, even if it's in the outside world, difficulties with people, maybe you have a court case, maybe you have a difficult boss, whatever it is, when you really understand your worth, it's almost as if you don't need those lessons anymore. And very often, not always, because new lessons come along all the time, but very often the things that plagued you the most seem to just fade away because you're working out the stuff that you need to work on. Because Hashem doesn't give you something you don't need. He never does. I'm not saying it always works that way because we don't know the reasons for everything, and I wouldn't pretend to, okay? But I know for myself and from paying attention to what's going on with me, me personally, I often see that, oh yeah, that's what I should be working on, okay? Or looking in that mirror and I see this, right? That's what I'm supposed to be working on. And, and you know, but I have to remember that I'm still a holy neshama and I'm gonna hang on to that part of myself that believes in myself in order to work through the parts that, if I'm not careful, could lead to atzvahs, could lead to this bitter depression. You know, there's a, this, you may have heard um, of the Gesher Tsar Ma'od, it's another favorite, famous song, right? Life is a narrow bridge. So one of the amazing things about Rabbi Nachman, which is a very famous thing he said, life is a narrow bridge, he said, don't make yourself afraid. That's actually was the original words, okay? Don't, don't terrorize yourself, okay? And 
and he's telling us that you know the the tra the song is a little different but he's telling us don't make yourself afraid don't 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 allow yourself to give in to the negative and the fear and the anger and the, it's up to you and the narrow bridge here is finding that tightrope walk between Daniela between okay yeah I there's things that you know what there's things I've done in my life they're awful but I'm I have this soul I have this neshama and I'm going to constantly work on finding the balance where I feel good about myself because in order to correct I have to feel strong you can't correct when you're a puddle on the floor you cannot fix anything when you don't have a sense of who you are. No? I was just thinking that when I was in Oman and it said, which means to terrorize. But now I'm thinking, and psychologically, and don't dysregulate yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so don't dysregulate. Right, done. Well, I think what, what um, I think you said it earlier, right, that to do this, to do this activity of, of building ourselves up is essential to feel joy. Yeah. And without that, you cannot really have that connection. Yeah. That mm -hmm. joyful connection that you could have otherwise. Right. So it's it's not even about thinking, you know, if we're trying to come back or not. It's just living this life as we're here in a more like, connected way, a more meaningful way. I think so. I think you're. I think that's that very valid way to look at it and you know initially in you know Rebbe Nachman ties in your understanding of who you really are and your self-worth and seeing the good in yourself with being joyful and, and he tells us in many places he says that if you aren't joyful you're you um you don't really have this you know the right the right relationship with Hashem because if you're not joyful that means that you're unhappy about what's in your life Right. And Hashem is giving you everything in your life. Everything in your life he's giving you. It must be good because it's from God. There's a good purpose in it. We don't understand always. I can't say it's always fun. But if we're able to be joyful, if we're able to see the good in ourselves and we're strong and we're able to be joyful, it's as if a light switch goes off in your life. It's literally like you're all of a sudden... You know? Where do we sign up for more? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have to learn. We have to learn together. So, okay. So we have to learn together. Maybe we'll do a big chavru, a phone chavrusa. I was actually thinking about putting together a phone chavrusa. Okay, that. All right. Everybody open your little, gr I'm going to name one more thing after that. Open your little group, but Judy's really into it. So do you, does any, does anybody have a mark? You have a mark. Oh, you yeah. want a book. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> the person with... Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations. Oh, oh, that's what your true God did, Mommy. It got you the, the prize. There you go. The prize for looking in the mirror, which is very brave, by the way. It's very hard to do. Yeah. You know? I mean, I remember the first... I did it, I was devastated. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know. Um, so, you know, look, I, I want to tell you that I that this is, you know, I, I, I'm not necessarily a person with one mission in life, but because I, I feel so, so grateful to Rebbe. I mean, yes, I love to take women to Uman, and yes, I love, you know, teaching whatever I'm teaching, and I just love meeting people. But this is really, I think, my core mission because I saw how not having this in my life nearly killed me. That's the truth. One day I'll tell my personal story, at least, mm -hmm. at least like 2% of it, no more. <laughs> and it nearly killed me. It, you know, it made me miserable, it made me unhappy, it made me phobic, it made me unable to put myself in someone else's shoes in a humane manner, even though I wanted to and I did care. Um, you know, and by having this, mm -hmm. I, I just feel that by understanding who we are and this core teaching that Rebbe Nachman tells us is so important, I feel that this is particularly a message for women because for men, self-esteem is often tied up with other things. 
And for women, it's become self-esteem has become tied up with performance. And it really shouldn't be. It's really not about for, for our performance, okay? It's really about um, just our, the core of us, our soul. And that's why I'm working on this book. If anybody wants information about how to be involved, please speak to me. Okay, we have other books that we're working on too for women. Okay, so if anybody's interested in any women's programs, I have some brochures here. And any more questions before we go? Comments? Well, can I just say something, especially 